We welcome you to the program today. If you will, please turn in your Bibles to the book of Esther, chapter 4. We'll be studying verse by verse through the chapter. Last time, we saw the promotion of Haman. And at the end of the book, we see the decree against the people of Mordecai. Esther chapter 4, verse 1. When Mordecai learned all that had happened, he tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and ashes and went out into the midst of the city. He cried out with a loud and bitter cry. Esther heard from Mordecai about Haman. Esther 4, 1 to 9. There's a couple passages I'd like to point out before we begin with this verse. Esther chapter 3 and 13. And the letters were sent by couriers into all the king's provinces to destroy, to kill, to annihilate all the Jews, both young and old, little children and men, little children and women, in one day, on the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month of Adar, and to plunder their possessions. And later in chapter 3 and verse 15, the couriers went out, hastened by the king's command, and the decree was proclaimed in Shushan, the citadel. So the king and Haman sat down to drink, but the city of Shushan was perplexed. That brings us to this passage in Esther 4 and verse 1. When Mordecai learned what had happened, he mourned for the people, his people, the Jews. Mordecai tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and ashes. The tearing of clothing and the putting on of sackcloth and ashes were signs of mourning. These were symbolic of burial and decay. Mordecai then went into the city of Shushan and he cried out. A coarse cloth of goat's or camel's hair was used in making sacks or bags. And so this cloth was also used to make clothing to wear in time of mourning. Sackcloth was coarse and uncomfortable to wear. As sackcloth was black in color, John wrote in Revelation 6 and 12, black as sackcloth of hair. In the book of Joel, the prophet Joel in Joel 1 and 13, gird yourselves and lament you priests. Well, you who minister before the altar, come lie all night in sackcloth, you who minister to my God. For the grain offering and the drink offering are withheld from the house of your God. And another example of sackcloth is in Amos 8 and 10. I will turn your feasts in the morning and your songs into lamentations. I will bring sackcloth on every waist and baldness on every head. I will make it like mourning for an only son and its end like a bitter day. And so we see here in Esther 4 and 1, Mordecai learned of what had happened and he mourned. Verse 2, he went as far as the front of the king's gate for no one might enter the king's gate clothed with sackcloth. And so Mordecai went in the midst of the city of Shushan as far as the king's gate. We see in Esther 2.19 and Esther 2 and 21 that Mordecai had sat within the king's gate. However, no one was permitted to enter the king's gate clothed with sackcloth in a state of mourning represented, which repre was represented by the sackcloth. Verse 3, and in every province where the king's command and decree arrived, it was great mourning among the Jews, with fasting, weeping, and wailing, and many lay in sackcloth and ashes. As the news spread throughout the kingdom, the Jews in every province who heard the decree mourned, there was weeping and wailing and with many Jews laying in sackcloth and ashes, 
we also see that there was fasting. Uh, one notable characteristic of the book of Esther, and uh, perhaps we'll talk about this later, is that the author does not explicitly mention God, the Lord, by name in the book. Neither is prayer mentioned specifically. However, God was certainly present, and certainly there was prayer. And so even though God is not mentioned by name in the book, by Lord or, or God, neither prayer specifically, we know that there is prayer among the people, the Jews, and certainly God was present. In Daniel 9 and verse 3, then I set my face towards the Lord God to make requests by prayer and supplications with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. Prayer accompanied fasting. Verse 4. So Esther's maids and eunuchs came and told her, and the queen was deeply distressed. Then she sent garments to clothe Mordecai and take his sackcloth away from him, but he would not accept, accept them. And so the maids or maidens and the eunuch who attended to Queen Esther came and told her. From what follows, it appears that they told her how Mordecai was mourning in sackcloth at the front of the king's gate. Esther chapter 4 and verses 2 and 3. And as a result, she was deeply distressed. Just how much did she know? It, again, it appears that, that they told her about the mourning of Mordecai, of him sitting in sackcloth. And so she sent clothes for him to wear, but he would not accept them. Verse 5. Then Esther called Hathak, one of the king's eunuchs, whom he had appointed to attend her. And she gave him a command concerning Mordecai to learn what and why this was. And so Esther called Hathak, a eunuch of the king, who was appointed to attend to her. She told him to learn what and why Mordecai mourned in sackcloth. And so she wanted to find out from the eunuch what was troubling Mordecai and why. So Hathak went out to Mordecai in the city square that was in the front of the king's gate. And so Hathak obeyed the command of Queen Esther and went out to Mordecai in the city square that was in the front of the king's gate. The city square was found in the midst of the city and was a place for community gatherings. As he was clothed in sackcloth, Mordecai had gone only as far as the front of the king's gate. Esther 4 and verse 2. Verse 7, And Mordecai told him all that had happened to him, and the sum of money that Haman had promised to pay into the king's treasuries to destroy the Jews. And so Mordecai told the eunuch, Hathak, all that had happened to him. The story might begin with how Mordecai would not bow or pay homage to Haman. The king's servants told Haman that, and he was filled with wrath. They also told Haman of the people of Mordecai, the Jews. Haman was so furious with Mordecai that he sought to destroy the Jews throughout the kingdom. We saw that in Esther 3 and verses 1 to 6. Mordecai also told Hathak that Haman even promised to pay money, a sum of 10,000 talents of silver, into the king's treasuries to destroy the Jews. In Esther 3 and 9, the passage reads, If it pleases the king, let a decree be written 
that they be destroyed. And I will pay 10,000 talents of silver into the hands of those who do the work to bring it into the king's treasuries. You might remember from our last study in Esther chapter 3 that there's no specific indication that the king knew the specific people. We only know from the text that Haman spoke to the king about a people who did not keep his law. Now here we see in chapter 4 and verse 8. He also gave him a copy of the written decree for their destruction, which was given at Shushan, that he might show it to Esther and explain it to her, that he might command her to go into the king to make supplication to him and to plead before him for her people. And so besides telling Hathak what happened, Mordecai gave a copy of the written decree for the destruction of the Jews in order to show to Esther to explain the written decree and to tell her to go into the king to speak to him. And so Mordecai wanted Esther to make supplication to the king. And so she needed to implore him and to ask him humbly and earnestly and that he be gracious and merciful to her people. The Jews were her people too. Again, as of yet, as commanded by Mordecai, she had concealed that she was a Jew. We see this in Esther 2.10 and Esther 2 and 20. Even her Jewish name was changed to Esther, by which she was known in Esther 2 and verse 7. At this time, Mordecai told Hathak to tell Esther to plead for her people. And so Hathak would now know that she was a Jew. While Esther probably did not tell her maids and eunuchs that she was a Jew, they may have been curious about her concern for Mordecai, Esther 4 and 4. Verse 9, so Hathak returned and told Esther the words of Mordecai. And so Hathak told Esther what Mordecai told him to tell her. The message would include telling her what was happening and what he wanted her to do. In verses 10 to 12, we see how Esther was afraid. Verse 10, then Esther spoke to Hathak and gave him a command for Mordecai. And so Esther commanded Hathak to give a reply to Mordecai. Verse 11, and all the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that any man or woman who goes into the inner court to the king who has not been called, he has but one law, put all to death, except the one to whom he, the king may hold out the golden scepter, that he may live. Yet I myself have not been called to go in to the king these 30 days. And so here in verse 11, we see Esther's reply to Mordecai. Everyone knows, she said, that the one who would go into the king must first be called or summoned. The law required death if any man or any woman went to the king who had not first been called. Only if the king held out the golden scepter to the person who approached would he or she live. She noted that in the message, it had been 30 days since she had been called to go into the king. Did she expect, did anyone expect this to change anytime soon? Well, the passage doesn't say, but even the, even the queen did not have unlimited or unrestricted access to the king. We see this. She herself had not been into the king for some 30 days. And so while Mordecai may not have known how long it had been since Esther was called to the king, he would have known the danger of going into the king without being 
summoned or called. He knew this. This was not news to him. Verse 12. So they told Mordecai Esther's words. Hathak saw that Esther's message was taken to Mordecai. He saw to it. The text reads that they told Mordecai Esther's words. The pronoun they may have included Hathak personally along with a, another, or perhaps he sent the message by other eunuchs or maids or maidens. And so they sent or told Esther's words to Mordecai. Verse 13, and Mordecai told them to answer Esther, do not think in your heart that you will escape in the king's palace any more than all the other Jews. And so in verses 13 to 17, we see Esther's response. Mordecai spoke to Esther through the messengers, and he tells her, he warns her, do not think that you are in the king's palace, that just because you're there, that you will escape destruction any more than any of the other Jews in the kingdom. Verse 14, he said, for if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. Yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. And so verse 14, let, let's look at this passage section by section. He said, for if you remain completely silent at this time, what Mordecai asked Esther to do was dangerous. He told her to go into the king to make supplication to him and plead before him for her people. She was right. If she went to the king without being summoned, she could be killed. It was the law. It had been 30 days since she had last been called to go into the king. She might choose to remain silent and not go into the king to save safe. Next, Mordecai said, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. And so if not from you, from another place. Even if Esther chose not to go before the king, Mordecai believed that help would come for the Jews from another place other than the king's palace. Mordecai continued, he says, but you and your father's house will perish. If Esther chose to remain silent and not to go into the king in order to stay safe herself, Mordecai thought that she and her family's father's family would still perish. The time would come when it would be revealed that her and her father's family were of Jewish ancestry. It was only a matter of time. It would be at that time that they too would face destruction along with the other Jews in the kingdom. What a kind of completed the thought by saying, yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. There was a danger for her. If she spoke or if she remained silent, either way, there was danger. Yet Mordecai suggested to Esther that it may be, perhaps, she had come to the kingdom that she had been made a queen in the king's palace, quote, for such a time as this. Mordecai believed that relief and deliverance would arise from somewhere for the Jews, someplace. This was his faith in the province of God. If Esther remained silent, 
He trusted that deliverance would still come. Yet he thought that perhaps the only reason she had been made queen was in order to save her people. A question might be, would Esther be willing, if need be, to sacrifice her own life in order to save Abraham's seed? So Christ could come? As we study the Bible, the Old and New Testaments, we see the promise, the son of David, and how that the Christ, the Messiah, would come. And so would Esther be willing to sacrifice herself in order to save his seed so Christ could come? It's, it's, it's a thought, something to think about. And later we'll think more about the province of God. But here in verse 14, Mordecai had faith. And while God is not specifically mentioned by name, he, he is present throughout the book in its pages. Verse 15. Then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai. And so Esther told the messengers to, to send the answer. Verse 16. Go, gather all the Jews who are present in Shushan, and fast for me. Neither eat nor drink for three days, night or day. My maids and I will fast likewise. And so I will go to the king, which is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. Here we see the courage of Queen Esther. Verse 16. Esther told Mordecai to gather together, to assemble all the Jews in Shushan, and to hold a fast for her. She told him that they should not eat and they should not drink for three days, night or day. With the news of the coming destruction, there was already fasting among the Jews in every province of the kingdom. While prayer is not specifically mentioned, it's not explicitly stated, we know that prayer accompanied fasting. We see this in numerous passages. Esther 4 and verse 3. She appears to be asking for the Jews of the city of Shushan to pray for her, specifically fast for her. But uh, no doubt uh, in, in my mind that prayer was included. She, and, she said that she and her maids would likewise fast. On the third day, she would go to the king and make supplication to him and plead before him for her people. Yes, it was against the law. That's true. There was that danger. Mordecai acknowledged that danger. Yes, it was against the law to go to the king without being called or summoned. Yet she told Mordecai with determination and courage that she would go, saying, if I perish, I perish. Earlier, she was hesitant to go. No doubt afraid of the danger. But hearing the words of Mordecai, we see her strength, her courage, that she would go knowing what could happen, but also knowing what might happen. Perhaps it's through her, through her that the people would be delivered, that she would be used to save her people. If I perish, I perish. Verse 17, so Mordecai went his way and did according to all that Esther commanded him. Mordecai went his way. He gathered all the Jews who were in Shushan, and he asked them to fast the three days for Esther. Do you suppose they prayed for Esther to have courage? She certainly had courage, I think, in, in what she sent to Mordecai. And so I will go to the king, which is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. I think there's also faith. 
Mordecai I certainly trusted in the province of God, and I, we, we think that Esther did as well. Now, we'll continue with the study, Lord willing, next time and see more of the story in chapter 5. We hope that this has been helpful today. We thank you for being here today, and we hope that you'll continue to be with us in the future as we study this great book of Esther. Thank you again.